Part 1 The network of DIBs in the upper troposphere went into the first setting of their luminosity cycle. Thousands of daylight illuminating beacons in a fixed honeycomb network pattern that spanned across sector Neo Americus began the 12 hour cycle of artificial daylight. The static web of suspended nuclear powered super lanterns would collectively brighten for six hours, reaching a peak, then reduce their luminance for the following six hours before turning off to usher in 12 hours of darkness that nobody called the night anymore. Sector Neo Americus a marvel of technology and engineered social order stood cleaved into what remained of two continents. The old references to Northern and Southern America were regarded as ancient now, things of the old soul cycles. So too were the oceans, gone and long forgotten, any trace of the recognizable ancient coastlines erased. Present-day Sector Neo-Americus was reduced to two large artificially lit interconnected ink blots under the constantly dark skies that were punctuated by sheets of silvery white flashes. Electric auroras, caused by the sea of cybernetic plasma discharges under sky shield. The huge, hovering DIBs poured down their artificial daylight through the drizzle, creating dirty rainbows and oily-looking auroras in the wet black sky that was devoid of any stars. The heavy, ever-present, low synthetic layers of dark cloud mass that was sky shield technology cut off all sunlight at the lower stratosphere. The endless, Undulating blankets of prickly darkness continuously condensed water vapor that came down as a constant, heavy drizzle over the super megalopolis. Towering, massive blocks of black buildings rose high up towards the artificial clouds. Ribbons of horizontal lights marked the hundreds of floors on each tower block. All around the many towers, Multitudes of smaller lights moved at phenomenal speeds in precisely programmed circuits. Drones and shuttles of all sizes and types moved at lightning velocities, slave to their cybernetic commands. Streams and channels of traffic moved at multiple different levels, speeds, and directions. A fine display of routine AI orchestration one of these shuttles, a personnel carrier, broke out of its circuit and came to a smooth stop, hovering neatly over the rooftop restricted zone of an anonymous black residential block. A few small scout drones sped out of their housing pods, attached to the outside of the sector security vehicle. They went ahead of some burly figures wearing strength and agility enhancing exoskeletons who bounded out of the doors that slid open. The hallway between the long line of stacked living capsules is pitch black. Normally, the motion-sensing lights in the ceiling would illuminate enough of the hall for anyone passing through. The whole ceiling was an unbroken, single panel that could light up in sections anywhere under the motion sensors. Tonight, the building's automated management system was bypassed by higher sector AI authority, and the lights reprogrammed to remain off. A crimson laser beam came to life, piercing the darkness and zigzagging across the surface of the high wall over the access ladders to the short capsule doors, coming to an abrupt stop at a barely discernible tag at the top corner of a particular door. Data is transferred. More reprogramming happens. The glowing red light beam turns off, and the darkness returns. Without warning, all of the lights in the capsule turn on to their brightest setting. The warm, 
dark space becomes a bright white fluorescent nightmare. Joe kicked and tumbled into a cowering position on his resting surface, bracing against the low roof of the capsule with one hand and flailing out in front of him with the other, screaming at the top of his lungs. The small door flies open, and a lightning spark reaches out towards him, seemingly in slow motion, making contact with his chest. For a brief moment, it feels like his body is on fire. And then, darkness. Pain brought Joe out of his quiet oblivion, searing muscular pain that made him want to scream again. But his head was covered, and something big, cold and uncomfortable was jammed into his mouth. Stop struggling and calm down, Denizen Joe, commanded a raspy voice. The cover was pulled off his head, and immediately the bright lights over his body blinded him. He instinctively shut his eyes tightly, but he just could not stop himself from trying to scream. Trying, without uttering as much as a sound. He was confused, blinded, and hurting all over. He kept striking his head against the hard surface he was lying on as he shivered and involuntarily struggled against his restraints. His mouth was wide open and painfully filled with this contraption that was intermittently blowing in air for him to breathe. Joe heard another voice. Is he ready? As ready as he's ever gonna be, replied the raspy one. Rubber hands grabbed his face and held his head down. Open your eyes! Now! Joe fought against all instinct and will that wanted him to keep his eyes shut. With monumental effort, he snapped his eyes wide open to find the harsh light now eclipsed by a dark figure standing over him. A dark, silhouetted mass blocked the brash lights and came closer toward him. It came close enough for Joe to just make out a pair of small, black, circular discs etched with fine, concentric circles on a pale white face where eyes should be. Something seemed to press right into the center of his head, an inexplicable pressure that grew rapidly, becoming painful, a feeling that his head was going to implode into a spot in the middle of his brain. After a few of the longest moments Joe had ever experienced, the pale, hairless head pulled back, allowing the light to flood back and blind him again. The pressure disappeared, and the strong hands released his head. High variance from birthing code with this un. Clear on the Nero pattern matching, though. He's nothing. Send him to the service center said the raspy voice from the head with no eyes. Okay, replied the other disembodied voice. The thing in Joe's mouth made a hissing sound, and his dry tongue became very cold. Then, more darkness. His nostrils filled with a strange smell when Joe regained consciousness again. His jaw ached, and his ears buzzed. He wasn't restrained anymore. Still, with his eyes closed, he brought up his hands to cover his face. Slowly, he peered through his fingers. The light was dim and gentler here. He couldn't recognize the loose-fitting pajama-type outfit he was now wearing. Hello, Joe, said a soothing voice that sounded close to him. Everything is all right. Do not be afraid. I'm here to help you. I will stay with you until you feel well. Can you hear me? Joe tried to speak, but nothing came out of his dry mouth and parched throat. His jaw and head hurt so much. Do not worry yourself about speaking. I can see that you are having trouble. Let me give you a drink of something that will help you. Joe heard a low hum coming close to him, 
he slowly moved his fingers away from his face and saw a type of service drone hovering about a foot from his head. A tube touched his lips, and a sweet liquid intermittently squirted into his mouth. Take as long as you need to recover, and sip as much of the revitalizer as you can. After what felt like many hours, Joe sat up, feeling much better. He was in what seemed like a padded bowl made to hold one person, with a hovering service drone right next to him. He could not see the ceiling or over the edge of the bowl while sitting, but did not attempt to stand up just yet. It was quiet, eerily silent. The place smelled of strong antiseptic chemicals, and the only light source radiated gently from the bottom of the drone. Great! You're doing so much better, said the drone. Joe sat more comfortably and got a better look at the drone. It looked like a hovering pan, small and circular, with a handle or arm extended to one side. A soft light shone from under it, illuminating most of the dark-colored bowl. Everything above was in shadow and indiscernible. I'm sure you have many questions. Feel free to ask me anything. The drone's low voice echoed softly in the huge, dark expanse. Joe tried to speak, but all he managed was a croak. His voice broke, and he became overcome with emotion. It is okay, Joe. Lie down again and rest some more. I will begin telling you some things that will help make sense of what has happened. A silvery, flexible telescopic tube reached out from the arm of the drone and touched his lips again. While lying in a fetal position, crying softly, Joe sipped more of the sweet liquid while listening to the calming voice of the drone. You are currently at the Sector Peace and Security Denizen Service Center, in one of the recovery shells. The peacekeeping agents have detained and interrogated you. There was reason to believe that you had access to some information that you were carrying in your cranial safe deposit data vault. The direct, mind-probing interrogation found you clear and innocent. Part 2 Joe made plans and scheduled a personal visit and consultation at one of the few white buildings in Sector Neo-Americus. It was a huge, prism-shaped structure with drone landing zones on the roof and at ground level around the massive jewel in the darkness. With all of his work and personal supplies delivered to him, Joe rarely had any need to leave his living capsule. Something had changed, though. He felt compelled, like he was on a quest to uncover something he didn't quite know or understand yet. Joe entered the building from the Denizen Transportation pod platform and walked across the large foyer to the long row of turnstiles. The place is filled with various people and androids, each focused on their destination, either into or out of the building. Even with so much activity in the open foyer, it is quiet. The sound-dampening technology successfully filters out footsteps, drone hums, and everything louder than a whisper. As Joe approaches one of the turnstiles, a green beam briefly flickers across his face. Welcome to your appointment at the Chrysalis Institute, Denizen Joe. You are entering an environment that uses perception-altering nanites. You are in good hands with us. Read a scrolling message across the large monitor display just above the entrance. The turnstile moved around as he approached, allowing him entrance. On the other side, Joe found himself walking down a short, narrow passage to a door at the end. As he neared the door, 
it opened to reveal a space of indeterminate dimensions that led into a virtual rainforest. It was all exquisitely projected with nanotized sensory cues. He could smell, touch, and hear the forest. If he focused just right, he could taste the freshness in the cool air. Some tropical birds overhead were squawking and squealing loudly. Insects buzzed, and everything was punctuated by the gentle murmuring of a distant stream. He continued walking forward taking in as much as he could of this private experience designed, just for him. A hologram of a picture-perfect nurse appeared, and was projected slightly to his right, with a bright, beaming, perfect smile. Hello, Dennis and Joe, and welcome to the Chrysalis Institute. How are you feeling this morning? Said the hologram nurse. The air smelled like the ground after a summer rain, a scent that Joe had never experienced before. Calmness flowed through Joe's mind and body. I can't remember how I felt before I came in. I just know that I feel great now, Joe replied. They both laughed. The gorgeous fake birds squawked and flew across the beautiful fake sky. Well, that is not a surprise, Dennis and Joe. The nanomites in our controlled atmosphere are tailored to specifically get you to your most relaxed and receptive state. You're in good hands with us. He was impressed with how well the hologram nurse got his birthing group accent right. It's been many soul cycles since he's heard anyone speak this way. Please, continue down the path to meet your technician who is eager to speak to you. When Joe moved, the jungle almost moved around him. A cool breeze caressed his face. Some leaves touched his arms and legs. Twigs crackled as if being stepped on. In just a few steps, Joe came upon a rock face with a low cave entrance big enough for him to crawl into. Everything was pointing him in that direction. A deer trail appeared on the ground, leading to the cave entrance. A shaft of sunlight came through the treetops and illuminated the entrance. Butterflies flew around and into the cave. He had to go in and see. As Joe moved towards the cave entrance, the birds all around squawked excitedly, making him laugh. He got onto his knees, crawled into the cave through the low entrance, and entered a replica of his first private living capsule after leaving his birthing group. This was such a long time ago. He sat in the middle of the floor and looked around in awe at the flawless reconstruction of a time that had long passed, and it was just as he remembered it. He loved what the technology could create from his denizen profile record. He had many favorite memories at that old capsule. A very long time ago. Another life, in fact. He sat in the middle and explored the tiny living space, allowing himself to take in all of the things that were once so familiar to him, laughing at the old text strewn around that he still hoarded back then. He looked out the only window on the wall, which was also a view screen. The black obsidian-like wall of the building across seemed to stare right back at him. So close, he could reach out and touch it, if the window could open. A hovercraft flitted silently by the window, no sound penetrating the insulated building. Everything was silent, the way he remembered it. He shuffled forward, stooped over to the window, and used the virtual control panel to bring up the menu display. He first tapped on the option, Mirror. The black building in front turned mercurial before the image snapped into a reflection of himself in the capsule space behind him. There he was, a typical Americos, mental augment of standard birth grouping, a strikingly long, 
hairless head on a lean set of shoulders. A flat, gleaming rectangular copper plate was embedded into his right temple above his ear. Pasty white skin flesh, the color of albumen, with deep-set, large, ash-gray eyes. Joe scrolled through the still-familiar menu options and selected his old favorite audio-scenic montage in the view screen mode. The living capsule filled up with the sound of a gushing waterfall and the calls of exotic birds now extinct. Streams of carefully projected rays of sunlight and beams illuminated the space, pouring down from beautiful fake clouds floating across the sky. A sky he's never seen in real life. He increasingly longed for a past he had never known, making him feel like an alien in a place and time to which he didn't belong. A gentle voice called his name and brought him out of his nostalgic daydream. He turned around and laughed self-consciously. The technician was in the room with him now and said, It's okay, Joe. You can relax here. You're in good hands with us. Please come over and sit down so we can discuss your wishes. Thank you, Joe said as he walked, bent over under the low roof to what used to be his favorite couch, his very first couch that belonged just to him. It was solid and felt exactly as he remembered it. Even a few stains he remembered were replicated, which made him smile. He could not stop looking around, remembering the past and wondering what things in this virtual living capsule were being projected and what were physical props like the couch. He couldn't tell just by looking. The android technician was a mechanical torso, an exquisite replication of an older 20th century woman with graying hair, large black framed glasses, and a warm demeanor about her. Everything was designed just for him. No one looked like this anymore. Just more reminders of how stuck he was to myths and images from an ancient world. A simple, lightly colored gown covered the technician from her shoulders down to just below her waist. From the waist to the floor, the android technician wasn't supported or attached to anything, but silently hovered at a steady height over the floor. When Joe was seated and comfortable, the technician glided over the slick floor closer to him. At the same time, she lowered herself to a more comfortable height above the ground, suitable for a conversation. After a comfortable silence, the technician says, Tell me all that you wish to say. I will only be listening without interrupting right up until you tell me you have finished. Take as long as you want and say as much as you want. I feel tired and emotional. The only thing that gets me through my day cycles is my mood meds, dialed up to the highest setting. Joe began. I'm struggling with my sector role and have been for some time. It's not merely a matter of stress. I appreciate what the mood meds do for me and all of the sound and light therapy routines during the resting periods. But these seem to be the only things in my life now. It's all just escapism at this point. I don't feel any kinship among people. Even the members of my birth grouping somehow sensed how different I am and have altogether kept away from me. I'm spending credits on conversation bots who are just fake, like everything else. No matter how well they can display empathy and share data on my subjects of interest. I want... I want something more real now. The fake mask over everything no longer hides my reality. I just feel I can't do this anymore. I came across information about the personalities program at the Chrysalis Institute, and I found it quite interesting, especially the part about expanding into yourself. That's not fake, 
right? It's about bringing out more of who I am, I think. More of my subconscious into my consciousness in a controlled way. Also, I get to participate more actively in the sector and earn credits without more physical augments. I can't do the physical augments. The private data vault implants took me forever to get used to, even though the surgical procedures all went well. My mind struggled with the perceptual changes. I believe there's nothing too physically invasive done at the Chrysalis Institute, right? Your procedures done with nanotech are transformational. With this, I don't have to deal with other agos or preaching sapiests any more than I need to. I won't be lonely anymore. Also, I can get rid of these digital safe deposit vaults in my head and terminate the restricting contracts. I did get some good offers for these contracts that I have, but I might not be able to cover the full costs of the procedure. I came over to find out my various options. That's all I really want to find out, I guess. Am I eligible for anything that will help me with the remaining credits after I sell my contracts? Otherwise, I've already made up my mind about wanting the procedure. After a long pause, Joe adds, I'm done now. Thanks. In a warm, consoling voice, the technician responds, I understand your circumstances. We at the Chrysalis Institute understand your situation. You're in good hands with us. We have good news for you, Joe. Really? Joe responds, getting excited. Please, begin with any bad news and then get to the good. The technician laughed joyfully. Joe couldn't remember the last time he'd heard that from another human, another Ago like himself. I don't believe you'll consider any of what I'm going to say to you to be bad news. The Institute has a few offers for you that will cover the full credit requirement for the procedure. What? Holy codes! Joe was duly surprised. I know what you're thinking. The technician continued. What's the catch, maybe? There are no catches, Joe. Our offers are all based on suitability. Suitability to you. The Institute is introducing an upgraded version of our personalities program, and we want to closely monitor the first group of candidates that accept this latest iteration of the procedure. This is the only world sector where this procedure has been safely formulated and where it is available. The technician added, The pan africa sector won't even allow this type of mental augment denizen to cross into their sector. Joe politely interjected, I heard that they got some bad medical tech from our sector, which caused a sort of zombie epidemic. Any links to this program? Asked Joe. One of the primary reasons for failure is improper implementation and management, the technician stated. With us watching you all the time, we're able to respond to whatever you may need in as little time as possible. We want to show all sectors that our personalities program graduates are safe denizens, and the procedure is safe. If you agree to the monitoring, you'll actually be an ambassador for Sector Neo Americus, not just the Chrysalis Institute. The open sharing of information about the successful lifestyles of our mental augments, along with other technologies, will help to greatly reduce the tension between the sectors and stimulate more cooperation. 
The other good news is that you have a selection of sector roles that will appeal to you to choose from. All we ask to do is monitor your experience. The cranial implants that you already have make you a valuable asset to the Institute. Once your contracts are sold, the sector credit earnings all go to you, of course. Your implants, with the client data extracted, will be altered without any further surgical procedures, allowing us to monitor you. Every part of your daily activities, and theirs, your thoughts, and their thoughts, the personas that you'll be bringing forth, every part of your life after you agree will be the copyright of the Chrysalis Institute. You are in good hands with us. Joe took a dose of his mood meds, an oral vapor spray in a silver canister with a little trigger. The medications as well as the delivery mechanism were created and designed just for him. He liked tactile buttons and switches, so the canister had felt good until recently. The vapor spray from the canister in his mouth still reminded him of that awful day with the peacekeeping agents. Even now, he couldn't help nervously looking up at the small door briefly. The information that Joe was looking at on his optical interface display was very exciting and unexpected. A virtual screen display floated in front of his vision, where he used visual cues to scroll down the information he was given access to by the Chrysalis Institute. These were the various sector roles that he could do after the transformation. The procedure was rather uneventful. He was put to sleep, and when he woke up again, he was told that it was all done and he could go home. How will I know when it's happening? Joe had asked the technician. One of these days, you will wake up to a new world and life. All you need to do is remain calm and expectant of your guest's arrival your other selves. The various sector roles intrigued him. Becoming an ambassador brought with it a lot of benefits, both social and economic. He was looking at various compensation schemes that were comparable to those of highly successful Augos. He could hardly make it past the first recommendation, though. The role's title simply stated, Companion. The brief description read, Spend time and provide in-person company to other augments who are like you, in the service of the Chrysalis Institute and subsidiaries. Joe didn't want to spend time with other people if he could help it, but somehow he could not bring himself to move past it. This particular option would provide him with new living quarters where he could actually stand upright in, instead of shuffling around a living space capsule on his knees. The position may require him to travel to other subsectors. His mobility was an advantage he didn't use much. The majority of present-day denizens spent most of their lives inside their living capsules anyway, so it wasn't unusual. He also didn't have to be an expert on anything specific. The sparse information about being a companion made him nervous, but then he remembered that he was not going to be doing this alone. The personas were due any time now. It felt like the quiet before the storm. He selected the accept icon next to the position, companion. All that was left for him now was to patiently wait. <laughs>